this evening, I, uh, I have a mission, and the mission is to uh, slightly rearrange your brain cells a little, uh, and, and I want you to finish up in the end of this uh, three quarters of an hour and the Q&A, uh, seeing the world very slightly different. Um, before we even start, uh, I have to tell you that most people find this subject uh, intimidating. What I've done here is to try my best to make sure someone with no education at all uh, in, in physics, right through to experts in physics, even people who uh, are in quantum computing, will get something from this talk. That, that is my objective. So I do want to try and demystify it as, as much as possible. Uh, so let's see uh, how this goes. So I thought we'd do this in a little bit of a reverse order for a start. Why the heck are we doing quantum computing? And there's a really good reason for this. Um, we will never understand uh, life, physics, biology, chemistry, especially in ecologies and all the other big problems that are important to us with our digital computers. They are just not man enough. Uh, the, the problems that we're facing would take thousands of years, uh, some of them with our supercomputers to compute to get an answer which is ridiculous. Quantum computers offer uh, the opportunity to get answers in a very, very short time period that are quite valid by a new uh, mechanism. So um, we are at the end of the digital road in, in many aspects. That does not to mean to say that digital computers are going to go away, quite the reverse. Uh, we're going to need more of them and we're going to know bigger, bigger ones and they actually play a part in quantum computing as you'll see uh, later they do actually uh, have a key role in realizing uh, quantum computing um wild claims um, these are the sorts of claims who uh, with people who have never built anything let alone worked in quantum computing and uh, they're bluntly quite ridiculous and uh, <laughs> quantum computing is not going to instantaneously decrypt all the credit cards on the planet. It's really not. And um, it, it's not going to make quantum encryption mandatory. Uh, and and it, it cannot simulate the entire known universe in, in uh, uh, less than 300 qubits. And um, it definitely doesn't improve your sex life. So here we are. The known universe. Um, this is where it all goes wrong. People get it too enthusiastic. So for the best estimate we've got, uh, there are about uh, 10 to the 80 uh, atoms or protons in the universe. It's something of that order. And so 10 to the 80 is roughly uh, 2 to the power 240. And so 300 qubits, 2 to the 300, uh, can actually um, make, has got something to say about the universe, and it could actually tell you where each of the, these atoms are and what their orientation is. Uh, that is quite uh, remarkable. Um, beyond that, it starts to get questionable uh, about what else it, it could have to say uh, about the universe. So, um, this one has hit the headlines quite a bit recently, quantum supremacy. Uh, this is the, uh, the, there's no clear definition of what this means, but broadly speaking, uh, quantum supremacy is when uh, quantum computers can do everything uh, that a digital computer cannot. Uh, so um, there's been a demonstration recently, uh, recently with just 53 qubits uh, by Google and it was a sliver, uh, just a sliver of a demonstration of outgunning a, a digital uh, computer. But to give you a benchmark, uh, a 70 qubit machine can fundamentally outperform uh, any other kind of uh, computer, any digital computer. And, um, but it can only do that under certain conditions. Uh, so let's just, uh, catch up and here uh, is somebody else's view of what quantum supremacy is. It's actually Google. To actually 
actually demonstrate quantum supremacy, we have these three steps. First, pick a circuit. Second, run it on the quantum computer. Third, simulate what the quantum computer is doing on a classical computer. We gradually increase the complexity of that circuit. At some point, it becomes completely impossible for the classical computer to keep up. Then we say we've achieved quantum supremacy. Started building together the quantum chips to do this experiment. And then the evolution of the devices with more and more qubits and more and more complexity. It's very much an iterative process. A lot of the work that we put in was not just these chips, but is also the infrastructure that you need to drive those chips. The cryostats that we install them in, all of the control electronics, software, all of this stuff is needed and it all has to be developed. So this is actually an immense uh, engineering uh, achievement. Um, to get a quantum computer to work with the current hardware, you have to get down as low as 10 uh, millikelvins uh, or less. That is 10 um, milli uh, degrees C above absolute zero. And that's a very expensive thing to do. So the problem that Google had, had actually uh, looked at uh, took three minutes and 20 seconds to solve. Best estimate, a supercomputer would have taken 10,000 years. Uh, and it, it's, it's absolutely right that is quantum supremacy in that very uh, small sliver of space for that particular problem. But it's not general uh, quantum supremacy. So let's have a look at some uh, key concepts. People like to make this a big mystery and uh, they get very excited about it. And, and it's very easy to get very confused. It's actually uh, not that difficult a concept. You've got a cat, you put it in a box and in the box is a uh, mechanism. The mechanism can activate at any random time in the future. And when it does, it kills the cat. So the situation is the cat's in the box. As soon as we close the lid, we have no idea whether it's alive or dead. So we make the uh, uh, rather dramatic uh, statement that the cat is both dead and alive, which is a way of saying that there's 50% chance it's alive and there's 50% chance it's dead. That's it. It's not any more complex than that, but it is pertinent to uh, the qubits that can be in a uh, two states with equal probability at the, uh, the same time. So second key concept is entanglement, uh, if you will. And so we can have um, an atom or, or an electron um, and uh, any other kind of particle, atomic particle, and uh, they have spin. And so we will say uh, uh, a qubit is uh, spin up it's a zero spin down it's a one or whichever way around you want to have it and if we take uh, two pairs of qubits uh if we take sorry if we take a pair of qubits uh we find that uh, if we entangle them they uh, they mimic each other so if one uh, actually uh, sits up uh, the other one then sits down and if we flip that one and the other one flips so up on one side, down on the other, down on one side, up on the other, that's it. Now, this is a mystery, but I think um, possibly not as, um, not as uh, clear as you'd hope. Even Einstein called it spooky action at a distance. By the way, this has been demonstrated over, over distances of 100 kilometers. We don't know why this works. Now this evening, all I can do is give you a conceptualization with a couple of magnets. So uh, here's an astonishing statement, if you like. We have no clue what fields are. We do not know what they are. What we can do is we can measure fields, uh, we can model them, we've got mathematical descriptions and we can use them. So this magnetic field, we don't actually know what it is, but gee, it is strong. So if you put two magnets together, as on the left-hand side, north to north, they will try to spring apart. If you put the magnets together, as on the right-hand side, north to south, they will attract each other. So now if you actually imagine that these magnets are floating 
uh, on a dense fluid and uh, they're separated by, uh, or, or on an axle, if you will, uh, they will automatically spin to orientate like this. This is effectively what is happening with our qubits, and that's explainable on over a short distance. What is not explainable is how the heck is it doing it over a, a long distance? So here is what we do know for sure, and this surprises people, but gravity is by far the weakest force in the uh, universe. And um, if you look at the weak nuclear force, it's 10 to the power 25 times that of gravity. So just for anyone who's not used to this mathematical uh, nomenclature, there is a one with 25 zeros after it as a multiplier. But if you come down to the electromagnetic force, or magnets, if you will, um, and um, <laughs> look there, it's 10 to the power 36, it's vastly stronger. But the strong nuclear force is 100 times stronger than that again. Now, the, we don't have a grand unified theory. We do not know how to link all of these together and get them to work. We don't even know if there are some other effects that we can't measure yet. So these are the sort of mysteries. Uh, this is one of the beauties of science. There's always uh, the unknown. So here we have uh, some computing basics. You're all used to this. Digital computers, binary bits, one or zero. There's no intermediate state. It's 100% true as a statement. And if we've got uh, n bits, then two to the n, possible state. So if you've got, um, um, if you've got um, four bits, you get uh, two, four, eight, 16 states. If you get 10 bits, two to the 10, you get 1,024 states and so on. Um, and the, the digital processors are serial. Uh, they just uh, progress from left to right, a step at a time, if you will. And uh, they're very much like uh, troops marching. They go in one uh, direction and they're very precise. Quantum computing and computers are entirely different. The qubit can be a one and a zero at the same time, alive or dead, just like Schrodinger's cat, probability of it being a one or a zero is 50%. And um, the uh, the states are instant. There's no serial processes here. It's absolutely parallel. And it happens uh, very, very quickly, but it's not precise. It comes with imprecision. So this gives us the first hint that digital computers are digital, but quantum computers are actually analog. There are the two statements uh, in uh, red and white. The other weird thing is that the quantum states actually propagate as energy waves uh, as opposed to electrical currents. Uh, we'll, we'll tackle that in a moment. But what we're looking for is a moment in the quantum computer where there is a coherence across the machine. You grab that solution and uh, you, you try and use it. Uh, that's what's actually going to happen. So here's digital computing. Uh, George Boole did a great uh, service to mankind by coming up with his uh, algebra. And uh, anybody that's uh, done any computing at all will recognize this uh, nomenclature. And uh, we've been able to design everything from mechanical uh, automatic devices, robots, telephone systems, digital computers, everything using uh, this nomenclature. Just everything that you use now in terms of technology is solely dependent upon that mathematical model. Quantum computing is entirely different. It's a new level of mathematics. Um, it's almost exclusively of a matrix form and the elements in the matrices are either ones or zeros. And guess what? They are the actual qubits in the matrix. And there's a huge library of these things that I will show you very shortly. And so this is the big message at this point. We're going back to analog with quantum computing. 
Um, they are definitely not deterministic. They're conditionally, uh, they're not conditionally stable and they, uh, they're not self-reliant. They don't stand alone. They are definitely analog and they're subject to quite massive uh, errors. So let's just get a slant on this, uh, just to explain a little further. The um, quantum computers have to have big digital machines to help run them because of the controlling of things like the cryogenic plant, the uh, addressing of the qubits and the reading of the qubits and uh, the control of the uh, environment in which the uh, qubits live. Uh, it, this is a big caretaker role, if you like. And um, they also have um, a job of work in terms of doing error correction. So positioning, what do we really know? Well, this fa famous uh, Richard Feynman quote of 95 still holds true, believe me. Uh, nobody really understands. It's not that um, quantum computing, sorry, quantum mechanics is... Uh, flawed or imperfect, it is the single most tested uh, scientific theory uh, mankind has ever put together, but it is still being developed. It's a work in progress. It is still being uh, refined. We have at least four different interpretations and some of the things that I've put actually uh, into this presentation, um, uh, being an engineer in my supreme arrogance, uh, are my, my view of what is actually happening. And so uh, this is the state of play. I've got a slightly controversial uh, quote here, but you have to think about it. Uh, this is Feynman who said this. I thought it was absolutely brilliant. Physics is to sex as mathematics is to masturbation. Yep, uh, physics uh, is the real thing. And um, no matter how much mathematical modeling you do, uh, you have to ultimately get some measurements done and do some experiments. So let's just do a, a little segue here and uh, give you a demonstration of, of what I mean. Um, this is really fundamental, but probability and statistics are a consequence of incomplete and sparse data. Quantum theory is a consequence of measurement and modeling inadequacies. So let me just uh, give a quick uh, demonstration here. Uh, right now you're in a one dimensional world and in this one dimensional world, all you can say is that you're seeing these colors, they're occurring in these positions and they are lasting for this amount of time. From that, you can derive all the uh, statistics. Now, all I have to do is provide you with a, another dimension, one more dimension, and you can see the whole picture. Newtonian mechanics explains all of this. And all I did was take you from one dimension to two. Right now, we are arguing about not just how many dimensions we need, but which dimensions we need to fully understand uh, this quantum world. Now, some people do not understand this about science, but believe me, uh, we've got away with partial information uh, from the beginning of time, way before Newton came up with uh, his uh, theory uh, of, of motion. Uh, we were killing each other perfectly all right with bows and arrows, uh, not knowing that mathematics. And so it is uh, with much of our technology. So at this point, uh, we're going to move on to a bit of a brain bender, and uh, I'm going to suggest to you that you put aside everything you thought or were taught about the atom and the atomic world and start thinking in terms of clouds of energy. So let me just refresh your minds about the scientific method. Um, and if you don't know this, uh, it, it's worth knowing. But the scientific method has uh, served as well for uh, many hundreds of years. But first of all, you make an observation, you form a hypothesis, you create a theory, and then you do an experiment. 
And either all of this agrees or disagrees. If it disagrees, you go back and start again. No matter how fancy your theory is, uh, if it, but experimentation doesn't agree with it, it goes back. When you do get an agreement, you're now up for a trial by fire. And I'll give you one example. Still today, people are devoting their lives in the science community trying to destroy uh, all of uh, uh, Einstein's uh, theories. Um, they're tested to death. And so um, I, I very often get people on radio and tea cite me a scientist who said something, and it doesn't mean anything. Um, if you make a discovery, that's interesting. If somebody else uh, actually confirms that discovery, that's interesting. But not until we've got tens of people getting the same results is it anything close to being accepted as a truth. That is the rigor of science. And so that makes it uh, very difficult for people on the uh, other side of the coin who come in with belief systems and uh, they, uh, they know what the answer is because they believe it. Um, and that's very easy. It costs no energy at all. Believe me, the truth and the truth of science is extremely uh, expensive. So uh, one more word from Richard. By the way, I never met this man, but I did sit in his lectures. It was on uh, eight millimeter uh, film and uh, he was an astounding teacher. Uh, he couldn't string together two words and make a grammatically correct sentence, but he was a phenomenal communicator. Here's the history. Uh, you probably had uh, John Dalton's uh, sort of uh, little uh, model when you were very young and the teacher perhaps broke a piece of chalk and said, if I keep breaking it up, I get down to this ball called Natum. And gradually you progressed uh, along to the right hand side. And uh, most people don't get past about 913, but on the uh, right hand side, you'll see Schrodinger's model, and it is a cloud of energy. So uh, the reason this, these models have uh, developed like this is that we have developed experimental uh, systems. So there's something working here that a lot of people don't uh, recognize, but um, the technology that we create using the science allows us to dig deeper into the science and create even better, more powerful technology. Ergo, we get to learn a lot more. So the actuality is that Schrodinger didn't derive his equations. This sort of popped into his head. He presumably uh, slept a lot, thought a lot, and uh, he came up with this, uh, these wave equations. And uh, it is a, a different way of looking. So the actuality is these are observations of atoms the various uh, people have made, and sure enough, they do look like clouds. And uh, this one is one of the latest, and uh, it's actual uh, uh, crystalline sub uh, material, and you, it's been uh, rotated, and you can see now and again fault lines appear where there are discontinuities in the structure, and the crystal is not quite perfect right through uh, that patterning. Again, confirming hypothesis. This uh, is just a statement of fact that um, uh, the atomic world is even less material than the solar system. It's really empty, um, far more empty uh, than uh, the solar system. The atomic world is mostly nothing. And uh, that is uh, a comment on the dispersion of the energy that is actually in the clouds. So the fundamental states for digital computers and, uh, and for uh, quantum computers, both at the same time. So this uh, is called superposition. And um, it uh, is really about the spin up or down. Uh, but this uh, casual notation of a, an atom spinning, if you look top right, it's actually spinning wildly in all modes at the same time. And uh, this depicts what is actually happening. It, it occupies a spherical world, and we tend to just look at it on one slice, one plane. Uh, but where the energy is, is clustered in, in a cone of uncertainty uh, due to noise uh, and due to... Uh, 
um, the actual uh, interference you get between many, many uh, uh, atoms. So uh, here we are. Anybody from the, the radio uh, end of the engineering spectrum will recognize this, but um, uh, ones and zeros, qubits of ones and zeros are only the starting point. We can actually, in theory, orient uh, the electrons or the atoms anywhere in this uh, sphere. And while it's known as a, a block sphere mainly, it's exactly the same as the Poincaré sphere if you work in optics. So, hey, deja vu, we've been here before. And so we can place uh, the signal state or, or the qubit state anywhere on that sphere, which means the exploitation is, is much greater. So I built a demonstration. Here's a cloud of energy. Let's uh, uh, just get it uh, moving. So here's a cloud of energy. and. Uh, what the heck is it? Where is it going? Why is it doing this? We don't know. We, there's not much we can say about it because it's just moving. But now if I, uh, I start, by the way, uh, that demonstration is, is, I've constructed it personally to make it readable by you, but you have to think of the electron moving 10 billion times faster. We're talking 10, to the 10 times faster than that is what an electron's absolutely doing. And uh, I can't get the, uh, <laughs> the software to go that fast. So here's, uh, I've slowed it down. And now you can look at it and say, oh, it's got two states. And when it stops, we know what uh, state it's in. So this is what is happening with the qubits, but it's happening 10 billion times faster than the previous video. Another behavior which is weird, people think, is that something will have a wave and a particle nature. I don't think it's actually that weird. And I think it's anybody uh, in telecommunications, wireless, uh, computer science, sampling will know about. A single pulse has a spectrum. And uh, the, the top line is the spectrum. If the pulse is repeated, it tends to have a line spectrum. And uh, the faster you repeat it, the, the wider that spectrum uh, uh, spreads out. So I don't see uh, the wave particle uh, nature as a paradox. I see it as quite natural. And so here are the key names, Fourier, Laplace, Hankel, Hilbert, Hermite, and Z transforms, if you will. If you know about this stuff, you have to, you have to go from thinking about time and um, and so frequency and wavelength or, or time and space and start applying it to uh, charge, atomic, optical, acoustic, everything else. So it may be a surprise to people out of the engineering di uh, discipline or science discipline, but believe me, uh, the, the Fourier transform is used in economics too. So I've built a little model for you. This is an everyday model, bingo, here's a demonstration. Uh, this is upside down, by the way, because the pulse as the water droplet, and it might as well be a stone, drops into the water. It goes down into the water, and that's the pulse. And from the pulse emanates a wave. Bingo. That is exactly the same principle. You have to only remember one thing in the quantum world to see that model works. All matter has energy. Energy and matter are interchangeable. So here's another demo of uh, superposition. So this is two pulses. There is uh, a parallel of this, which is what is happening in the wavelength domain. Uh, and I don't have a, a simulation of that. So here we are. Uh, we have uh, a qubit, it's up, down, and uh, it can be both at the same time. So here are the mathematical operators, I promised you, and you can see the matrices of various size. Each one of the elements, the zero, the one, is actually a qubit. Uh, they do various things. And uh, we bang in some uh, stable input tensors, i.e. Uh, collections of vectors or, or uh, states. And what comes out is a noisy set. 
And somewhere in that noisy set, there's a valid answer. And that is the, uh, uh, the problem. So we have to create an algorithm or a, a facsimile. And, and, and bluntly, uh, some of the stuff is, is just an analog of the real world that is actually built, which actually goes back to the beginning of our uh, analog computing days with electronics. And uh, what we're looking for is a coherence that occurs now and again, where everything is in, in synchrony, if you will, and that is the, uh, the eigenvalue that we're looking for, the point of stability or uh, the lowest energy state that's uh, occurring. So uh, a little bit more detail here. Um, <laughs> some of this now starts to get really a little bit tough, but this is just one particular gate, which uh, people would usually call something like a C not gate. And um, this is um, entirely different to uh, Boolean algebra. And these are all concatenated. And so uh, it might look like this. And each one of these elements is a different kind of um, uh, matrice. And then what happens is quite uh, wonderful. Um, waves of states, it is an energy wave that goes through this thing and gradually in here somewhere, one of these uh, gives you uh, the actual answer. So you have to think in terms of uh, a bit stream uh, and, and stuff marching through in a well-behaved manner, but more of an a wave of energy going through that is of different forms and but it has coherent states and when it gets coherent that's when all of the uh, there's an alignment that gives you uh, an actual answer so uh, here's the much celebrated Shor's alg algorithm and you will know it is uh, those of you are familiar with the uh, nomenclature there's actually a Fourier tra transformer uh, right in the middle of this uh, computing block bingo uh, I'd like you to guess what that's for, but you know, think of finding patterns. Now, this thing uh, can actually uh, decode RSA uh, encryption, which is on your credit card. Um, but it is the only way of decrypting at the moment. And um, in actual fact, you don't have to increase the encryption uh, very much uh, more than we've got today. Um, to make it impossible for Shaw's algorithm to work. So it's not the nightmare that people have been uh, talking about. And we are nowhere near, absolutely nowhere near, having this working with sufficient qubits to crack uh, a credit card or a bank account. So the architectures are very uh, varied. They, um, for those of you in the know, you've probably heard about uh, uh, D-Wave, and that, that's actually an annealing machine. It, it's about optimization. Uh, and then uh, the, there are facsimiles, if you like, the modeling of a situation. Uh, and then uh, there's the programming. And at the moment, we're nowhere near programming a, uh, a, a quantum computer. We're, we're in the first two uh, states. And um, it's the uh, computer, the, the digital computers do it. So here is the uh, output, it's all over the board. And uh, what happens is you get answers, a, a deal of scatter. You go and have a look at the most likely, uh, the, the cluster of the most likely, and uh, you then uh, have to apply a digital computer uh, to, to check that they actually work. So what does that mean? Well, we've got a very, very complex problem say factorizing a massive uh, uh, prime number with thousands of uh, digits. And uh, we come out with some answers, but it comes out with a range of answers. Well, uh, we've got two numbers and uh, it's actually very easy for a uh, couple of numbers to be fed into a digital computer and be multiplied and checked against what that answer is. So uh, the, the digital computer acts as a sieve and sorts through this lot and finds the actual uh, answer we're looking for. That's it. That's how it works. Uh, it's that crude. Um, but there is a glimmer of hope that we may, with new technology, get the instability of the process down 
an order of magnitude uh, and get uh, really good answers. At the moment, uh, a, a qubit um, error rate is of the order one in a thousand, which is about the best we can do. Well, if you start concatenate them, supposing you have a, a, a thousand qubits concatenated, and by the way, we're, we're mostly below 100 at the moment, you can start to see you're going to get uh, rather a, a, a large error rate, and, that, and that's not good. So we finish it with a verified result, and it works. <clears throat> now, here's a, uh, a sort of a progress graph, and uh, you can see uh, how it's, uh, it's come along. It really started in 98, and people have been struggling uh, with the hardware, and um, it is uh, sort of getting quite impressive what they're doing, but we're around that 100, 128 number. Uh, we're, we're stuck there at the moment, and people uh, are looking at these huge constructs uh, with cryogenic <coughs> chambers and saying, this is not the way, there must be a better way. Um, by the way, uh, this little picture that's inserted is an interesting one uh, because it's a spatial diagram uh, with time and, and it shows the, uh, the states of um, qubit uh, polarization uh, as a wave of uh, activity goes through. And hey-ho, uh, you can see <laughs> lots of lines of coherence uh, lining up, if you will, uh, that... Um, give us interesting information, I presume. I don't know, but I just thought it was a cute diagram because that's what we uh, we see in uh, other uh, dimensions uh, of, of this. So just watch this on the progress ago, report. A design for a scalable quantum computer based on encoding information on an array of phosphorus atoms in a silicon lattice was conceived at UNSW Sydney. This approach of building a computer chip out of individual atoms was long thought to be impossible, but a team of researchers has now created a super fast two qubit gate, the central component of a quantum computer, validating this idea. Over the past two decades, we've developed completely new fabrication technologies that have pushed the boundaries of what's humanly possible at the very smallest scale of the quantum realm. Donor qubits in silicon have held the world record for the longest coherence time and highest fidelities. Using our atomic fabrication technique, we can optimize every aspect of the chip. We've demonstrated exquisite control to achieve extremely high fidelities. And we've demonstrated the lowest electrical noise atomic scale circuitry to connect to that qubit. And now, with our atomic precision manufacturing capability, we've been able to build a really fast, highly accurate two qubit gate, the fundamental building block of a scalable quantum computer in silicon. The team uses a scanning tunneling microscope to precision place and encapsulate phosphorus atoms in silicon. Getting the distance between the two qubits is critical. We can engineer the whole device with atomic precision. We've managed to place the qubits just 13 nanometers apart in a silicon crystal. This exact distance allows us to quickly control the interaction between them. We have also been able to fabricate the whole control circuitry with sub nanometer precision to maintain our high fidelities. This circuitry allows us to entangle the electron spins that holds the encoded qubits by applying voltages to the gates. We have controllably moved the electron spins together for nanoseconds, then brought them apart and measured what had happened to them. Tracking in real time, what state the qubits are in, how they interact and evolve. Using this interaction, we can entangle the two qubits and swap their states by timing how long we let them intact. This is the first time anyone's been able to interact two electron spins between different atom qubits. A lot of people thought this wouldn't be possible since it is at the very limit of human engineering needed for every aspect of the device. And this was the final fundamental experiment we needed to do to prove that we could actually build a quantum computer out of atoms. Our next goal is building a 10 qubit quantum integrated circuit. And we're aiming to do this within the next three to four years. Believe me, that is stunning. Um, I never thought that I would see anything like that. Uh, and I never thought that I would ever pick up an atom and move it from one place to another. 
but about seven years ago, I did that in Canada uh, with an electron tunneling microscope. I actually picked one atom up and put, placed it somewhere else. Uh, it takes your breath away. Um, one of the interesting problems about that is that the coherence distance uh, between uh, qubits on a chip uh, is not very uh, long. And so uh, a big challenge is to keep all the qubits within uh, the coherence distance uh, so that the entire machine uh, will work as a whole. That single chip will work. The problem is going to be when you need 50 of them. And I can imagine that we may be finishing up with 3D chips to actually encapsulate them and keep them all coherent. So that, that is the overview. That is uh, just coming up to uh, sort of 45 minutes. We've gone from A to Z of uh, quantum computing and I now do want to do a, a sanity check here because, uh, you know, where are we? Well, um, I can remember as a young man seeing computers being delivered and uh, these were digital computers and it would be the payroll computer that's what it did nothing else um they were um, artillery uh, gun control computers um they were tax computing computers um and so on and so it, it wasn't until i was uh, a young engineer that um, straight out of university where program control uh, started to come into being and, and I had a, a hand in uh, doing some of the coding on that uh, for uh, telephone exchanges and uh, general purpose computing was was really uh, uh, not there but all of a sudden we got general purpose computing and what then happened was the PC and now uh, we all have uh, wonderful devices. So um, if you've heard the name Cray and Cray supercomputers, well, I knew Seymour really well. He, he was a friend and uh, I was once with him at his uh, works and I was looking at his Cray 2 supercomputer and I jokingly said to him, do you think I'll ever get your Cray 2 in my pocket, Seymour? And this thing I'm holding here is 50 times more powerful than Cray's machine. This is a miracle. Uh, people have no clue <laughs> what is in here. Now, what we can say about this is, there's a, we've been here before, and so there's a, a springboard here. And I'd like you to notice something. Down at the bottom here is a little thing. It says electric motor for the two megabyte hard drive. There's the electric motor right in the middle of the screen at the bottom, very visible. And along to the left are the disks for the hard drive. Uh, now, as a young man, uh, one of my first jobs as a professional engineer was to go out and buy a 20 megabyte hard drive and it cost 20,000 pounds. That progress, that rate of falling in cost per bit and byte has not been experienced in any other human venture ever. And I think we're going to do it again with quantum computing. So here we are right now. You can uh, go out and buy a quantum annealing machine, an optimizing machine, and uh, D-Wave is, is one. And this is the space we're actually in where we're doing quantum simulations. And we're trying to get these chips to work. And we're trying to get the system stable. And we're trying to get them big enough to do useful things. But the big goal is yet to come and it is the universal quantum computing engine uh, between 100,000 and a million qubits. This is where we become rulers of the universe, if you will, and we will be able to uh, work some pretty magical things. At this point, we will have models of the human body that are so precise and so powerful, we will be designing uh, drugs will be understanding the big problems of not the genome, but all of the protein folding, but best of all, the communication between the genome and the protein, which is the nest of almost all human ailments, including cancer. Cancer is effectively a communication problem between genome 
uh, and, and, uh, and protein, but we can't analyze it, we can't find it, measure it, understand it until we get these machines. Along the bottom there is some time scales. I don't think we're going to get out of this simulation situation uh, for another five to 10 years. And I don't think that we are going to get the universal quantum computing engines uh, for another uh, 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 five to 10 years after that. We are looking at those kinds of uh, uh, time frames. So uh, I think there's an awful lot to um, look forward to. Uh, the thing that uh, slightly worries me is that uh, I think I was born a little too early. By the way, um, I've just popped something up there. Quantum, quantum computing as a service already is already available, uh, but it's not all that useful. But I think that uh, quantum computing as a service is how you're going to get it on something not like this, but something you wear, or better still, something that's implanted. Um, but we'll see, or at least you will. So there you are, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I've got one final quote for you that slightly popped into my head this afternoon, but quite literally a digital computer is to a piano what a quantum computer is to an orchestra. Thank you. Peter, thank you very, very much. That was a thoroughly uh, enjoyable lecture, uh, as I've seen by a few comments in the chat, actually. So if I could ask you actually just to open the chat down the bottom, uh, it might be quite nice for you to see a few of the comments before we move on to the Q&A. Um, yeah. And yeah, if you guys have enjoyed that at home and appreciated Peter giving up his time, uh, if you wouldn't mind just pinging a little comment or uh, clap or something like that in the chat, I think that would be a really nice show of appreciation, which is quite difficult sometimes, isn't it, when you're doing a, uh, a, an online webinar. Uh, so um, as those uh, are coming in, uh, thank you very much, everybody. Thanks, Thomas. Thanks, Roger. Uh, thanks, Mark. Uh, Santi Kumar, John Davis, thank you very much. It's lovely to see. So yeah, it's nice to know uh, that Peter's been appreciated there. Um, yeah, very nice to you guys. Thank you so much. In terms of the Q and A, uh, Peter, we've had a few questions come in. Um, again, if you click on the Q and A feature, uh, you'll be able to see those and, and read along. Uh, I'll verbally ask them because uh, it might be quite sure. uh, nice for people yeah. at home. So um, I'm going to uh, jump into the. Um, first question uh, which is from Yasmin actually uh, it's yeah. the second one down on the screen there so Yasmin said uh, great talk uh, I have a question uh, what are the biggest limitations uh, in building fully functional quantum computers uh, apart from temperature um, well let me give Jasmine an example um, I, I don't really like to talk about anything that I've not worked on in, in some aspect so many years ago uh, I had a thousand strong research team and prior to that, I had a, a hand in designing optical systems, and we had some awful difficulties of trying to get the engineering to line up with the physics. There was always a, a, a 3 dB difference, a factor of two difference between what the theory said and what we could build, which was really irritating. And uh, the physicists had one view, the engineers had another, but there were great uncertainties. And where did these come from? Uh, I had a clean room uh, to work in, to do this work, I had to go in and sit down and not move for half an hour. And we had to wait for my body temperature. This was an air conditioned room, very precisely air conditioned room, but the energy from my body heat in the room upset the experiment. And whilst in there, I couldn't talk or make a noise because it upset the experiment. It was subject to uh, temperature, uh, vibration of any kind, electromagnetic radiation, i.e. radio waves, and we had a dog of a problem to try and screen it from the environment that it was in. And um, eventually we, we got stuff to work. So um, we were working on things like quantum dots, which is what the video was showing. We were, we were working on that 35 years ago. And um, we just could not get anything to work properly. We couldn't get down to the temperature that these people were working at. We hadn't got uh, the quantum scanning microscopes that they enjoy. So we were way too early, um, but it was really interesting. So it's really, um, a lot of it has been said uh, in that video. It's the precision of the building. We're not talking 
about bulk realization of things anymore. We're not talking about chunks of material uh, like the chips in here. We're talking about building devices an atom at a time. And then we're talking about not having any impurities at all, not having any crystalline or order um, uh, damage or, or errors, and then having it thermally very, very stable and having it isolated from the environment. It's quite an engineering challenge. Uh, tr truly mind blowing. Uh, totally, totally. Uh, in terms of the next question, uh, we'll keep it keep it moving at pace, uh, Peter, seeing we've got you for a limited time. So the, the question from Richard uh, Farnborough, uh, can you explain more about Shaw's algorithm, please? Uh, yes, um, the mathematics of it is, is, quite, uh, is quite deep. Um, so I'm going to put up my, my hand here and say, um, I've had a, I did uh, mathematics at a degree level, uh, for five years, and uh, I've I've uh, sat down with it, and um, the way it actually works still remains a mystery to me. Okay, I don't know, yeah. um, and, and 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 part of the problem is finding enough time to sit in a corner with a wet towel around the top of my head. <laughs> <laughs> it feels a bit like that at times, definitely. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Thank you. Um, question from Beverly. Uh, Beverly said, thoroughly enjoyed this. Thank you very much. Uh, what are the best use cases for quantum simulation uh, and quantum annealing, you know, have you seen? What are the, what are the best use cases? Um, well, uh, at the moment, the best use cases have been things like um, optimization. So let me give you a good example. Um, if you are designing uh, something like a, a turbine blade, uh, this is not uh, an area of crudeness. Um, you know, when, you, when you're at school and, and if you go to university, you may get a chance to have a play with a, a wind tunnel at university and it's all about laminar flow and there's never any laminar flow. There's always turbulence in there. And so the rewards uh, for understanding and optimizing the shape of a turbine blade are such that you can reduce um, the fuel consumption by 20% or increase the, the thrust by another 30% or whatever. These are big gains. And there, there are other gains uh, like um, you know, the reliability. So the aircraft industry, aerospace, has been phenomenally successful of being do being able to do more and more and more with less and less material, safer and safer with better performance. Uh, absolutely magic. Um, the other ones have been in uh, things like uh, drug, pro uh, drug production, where you're trying to uh, optimize chemical reactions. Uh, so the, those are the ones. The ones I really look forward to, and I'm probably not going to see, is uh, you wouldn't believe it, but. <sighs> Protein folding, you know, the, ge the genome issues an instruction and uh, a bunch of cells decide to be a nose or a toenail or a tongue <laughs> or a piece of hair. <laughs> and we don't know how that works. Uh, decoding that turns out to be real difficult. The best insights we've got so far are using artificial intelligence, but we desperately need uh, quantum computers to help us do that. Uh, the, other, the other big ones, I mean, Quite literally, we are not going to survive without these machines. If we don't have them, we will not be able to get um, sustainable societies. We, you know, saving bottle tops doesn't create a sustainable society. In fact, there's not a single recycling scheme on the planet that actually works. Period. Um, all, all of the, um, you know, the sort of green energy, not really green. It, it all costs, uh, and this is because people take a narrow view uh, of, of what is happening, and so to help us get to the right materials, the right decisions and the right results, we, we need this. So I'll, I'll, give, you, I'll give you guys a, a poignant uh, statement. Um, this is a, an industrial view. We've actually got to stop manufacturing more and more for the few, and we've got to start providing sufficient for the many. There are sufficient resources on this planet to keep everybody alive at a reasonable standard of living. 
And if we do not do that, we will never have a planet without war and conflict. And we stand, we, do, we stand to destroy the planet if we're not careful. Yes, it's quite scary, if, not, if I'm honest to so, say. Uh, I feel like, uh, actually, Peter, that uh, probably like many, I'd, um, I'd love to spend an afternoon in a, a pub or a coffee shop uh, ch chewing the fat. I feel like the, the conversation uh, would be very uh, enthralling across a number of topics. Um, but in terms of this evening, I'm a little conscious of time, but if it's OK, if you have the time, maybe take two or three more questions. Yeah, uh, I, okay. I've, I've, I've afforded all the time in the world for this. I, my yeah, students no. very often uh, surprised. I, I give them any amount of time to help them understand. And, and so I would point out to all the people who've, who've, who've been on uh, this and have been so kind of their comments that uh, my homepage uh, is an open invitation to go in uh, have a look at all my slides and my papers and um, and uh, help yourself uh, feel free to use them. You don't have to cite me, uh, you can use them. Um, I always remember my research professor saying to me uh, one time, you know, Mr. Cochrane, if you go out there and steal one man's results, it's plagiarism. But if you go out there and steal 10 men's results, that's research. So I always advise students to do plenty of research. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. Um, okay, uh, we're going to jump onto a question from Roger James. Uh, Roger says, can I ask a question? Uh, since quantum uh, is an analog computer, uh, how and what are the skills needed for programming? How does that work? Um, the, the, what is actually happening is Microsoft, as far as I'm aware, are uh, the company on the planet who have put more energy in to uh, writing code. Uh, at the moment, there's not even an operating system or operating system equivalent for uh, a quantum computer, and we need one, okay? What we have got is a bunch of algorithms. So what people have been doing is writing algorithms. Now, to write those algorithms, as one of your uh, questioners said, you know, can you explain Shaw's algorithm? Well, actually, that is uh, an interesting uh, mix. Uh, you need uh, really a degree in mathematics uh, and then uh, you need uh, a degree in conventional computer science <clears throat> uh, and then you need a bit of inspiration. Um, and like a lot of these uh, uh, modern situations, uh, if you go and have a look um, under the covers, if you like, there's not a single person writing the code. It's a team effort and they don't get it right first time. Oh, I mean, it's hard. <laughs> oh, I can only imagine. I can only imagine. Yeah. Um, keeping, keeping things moving. Th well, first of all, th thank you very much for all the questions so far, but uh, there's still a few more here, so I'm going to keep it rolling. Uh, we've got a question there from uh, Steve Roberts at the very bottom, uh, and he was saying, uh, you know, how can you tell that quantum bits are entangled at large distances? Um, what has happened is people have um, actually set up experiments and... Um, and uh, actually measured measured it. Uh, I have to put my hand up and say, I have a degree of skepticism about some of this. I do have a degree of skepticism as some of it. Uh, like, a, um, I, I actually, I, I never met Feynman, but I met a lot of his friends. And a lot of them are very, very skeptical about spooky action at a distance. Uh, and, and people fall into, you know, two, two scientific camps, I think. They, the deeply sus suspicious and skeptical and the true believers. <laughs> and there've been a number of experiments using satellite links and using optical fiber. And uh, you, you can see uh, some really good results for quantum encryption using this very uh, technique. Uh, and so um, if you um, actually search um, uh, uh, quantum encryption, uh, you you'll find uh, papers on the subject. The, the experiments are quite detailed. I mean, it seems to work. I don't understand why. Uh, it always makes me uh, nervous when there's not a, a good uh, description of, of why. But, um, you know, that's the way it is. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, a question here from uh, Tim Davis. Uh, Tim's asking, you know, is there a need to consider the philosophy and ethics uh, outcomes before we unleash the power of quantum computing? Um, and, and if so, you know, who, who's doing this? Um, the answer to my mind is absolutely not. 
Um, that will certainly come later. Uh, if mankind had sat down and considered the ethics and uh, and all, all the other aspects before they did anything, we'd still be in a cave. And um, here, here is the, the real conundrum. Um, there is not a bad technology. We, we never created a technology that was evil or bad or was going to do anything. The evil and bad comes from people. AI, for example, has the power to save people's lives. Uh, without AI, none of the medical scanners would be doing their job and most of the technology on the planet wouldn't be doing its job now and it saves lives. But if you stick a gun in a robot's hand powered by AI and teach it to kill people, that's, <laughs> that's a, a human failure, not a technology failure. And, and it, it's, it would be absurd to think that you will not get people using AI for bad purposes or quantum computing for bad purposes. Now, given that, you can't stop this because it's happening all over the world in all kinds of countries, in all kinds of political situations for various reasons. You're not going to stop it. So if you don't understand it, you've got nothing to say and you can't see where the problem is coming from and you can't dis defend yourself. This is the, if you like, the sad part of the reality. Um, and I have to tell you that um, I have worked in and out of defense all my life, but there is a line on the uh, floor in the sand that I, I carved with, an, with my sword. I won't go over it. I will only work on defense technologies with big defense. I won't build things that are designed to kill people, but I can't think of a single technology that I've not been involved with where somebody has found a way to use it for an evil purpose. You know, and that and that is part of the conundrum. You're trying to save human lives. You're trying to better the human situation. You're trying to improve things, but someone somewhere will spin it around. And I don't know a solution to that. It's true. Yeah, I think as innovators, people just focus on the positive, don't they? And they have sometimes no idea where it's going to end up at, at the end once it gets released out there. So. And um, we've got three final questions, uh, which we'll, we'll get through and then we'll wrap things up. Um, so uh, question from Hannah, uh, thank you for the amazing keynote. Um, she'd like to hear more about what the implications are in quantum computing, quantum computing in data science, uh, machine learning and things like that. What, what are the impacts of quantum computing gonna be in that area? Okay, well, uh, uh, one of the things I did, I, I had, um, I've been going to work for uh, 58 years, would you believe, and um, uh, this year I presented a bit of a challenge. I've been in education uh, since the 1970s as a visiting professor, and um, I made the decision to uh, actually close down my company and go into education full time. And I've taken the grand title of a professor of sentient systems. So what intrigues me is the very area uh, beyond AI uh, at this level of, of, of sentience. Now, it turns out um, that the whole universe is a quantum machine. Uh, we are quantum machines. Chemistry is, is a quantum uh, effect. And so I have a feeling that it could be that um, the highest levels of sentience come about through uh, quantum effects. I don't know that. Right now, what I do know is that I can quantify intelligence mathematically. I can actually say something about it beyond the philosophical, which bluntly doesn't tell you anything at all. And what I'm striving to do is to take it a, a leg further uh, into uh, what sentience really is. Now, I have a feeling that I'm going to get a, a little chink <laughs> in, in the curtains and I'm gonna get a glimpse of what it is, but to actually open those curtains fully and understand it, we're going to need uh, um, uh, uh, quantum machines. And, and that, that is true, by the way. We know virtually nothing about chemistry, that might surprise people, 
Um, but, but the models we've got are so damn crude, it's, uh, it's a miracle we've done. This is true of everything the human race has done. The models are incredibly crude, but we've got away with it so far. And uh, the, the levels of sophistication that we now need are far greater. So that, that, that's where I, I sit on the subject. Um, okay, thank you very much. Uh, we're going to go to John's question now, John Davis. Uh, his question is, does quantum computing obey the church Turing hypothesis? Uh, i.e. can a quantum computer compute the Turing computable functions and only those functions? I've not really thought about that, but um, I, I'm rather dismissive of the, uh, uh, the Turing test. I think it's insufficient and it's incomplete. Um, and I don't think it, it uh, for me, it, it, it does not, um, um, shall we say, add much value uh, to, to the uh, argument. Um, okay. You know, I've I've met uh, <laughs> I've met people where I would question if they were intelligent <laughs> uh, or, or able to compute anything. Um, so the answer is um, I don't know. I I really don't know, and I don't I I don't know because I uh, I don't I don't think the fundamental hypothesis is right. Period. I think it's wrong. Some people think, think that kind of statement is arrogant. I'm being honest uh, about it. Um, that's what makes science so wonderfully uh, en uh, enjoying because you, you can disagree with who you like, no matter what your name is uh, or, or how many degrees you've got or, or whether you've got an OBA or nothing, it doesn't matter. You know, you, you, you're, you're fair game. Have a so. discussion. We can have a discussion, yeah. It's an interesting Perfect. question. Perfect. Uh, we're going to wrap things up with a question from Beverly. Uh, Beverly O'Neill's uh, clearly been inspired uh, and she's asking, do you have any uh, book paper recommendations uh, for people to con continue reading uh, more about quantum computing? Um, <clears throat> well, uh, in actual fact, uh, I have a suggestion for Beverly. If you go on to YouTube, there are a whole series of presentations that, that, that come from not being rude, the very fundamental level right through to the complex level. So if you want to see something to take your breath away, um, uh, type in a search of something like um, uh, Microsoft, uh, this is in YouTube, Microsoft, um, the mathematics of, uh, of quantum computing. Um, I've got um, a, a rather large binder here. I've been watching it, and it is a brain ache program. <laughs> it is a brain ache tutorial. It goes on for hours, uh, and I, I've learned quite a bit. Uh, but it's very deep. At the other end, uh, there are lots of people um, doing really neat short seminars, and the beauty of them is you can watch them again and again and again, and, and then you can move up a notch. Um, as far as the, the papers are concerned, whatever you do, don't go to the academic papers. My God, they are written um, in third party uh, Greek. Uh, the, the, you know, if you're in, if you're in the, uh, the profession, if you're a professional, you can wade your way through them. They are incredibly stiff and difficult. Better to look out uh, for journal articles, but I would recommend watching these movies. It's a lot less uh, time consuming. And then there's a whole host of podcasts you can listen to. Um, and let me just give Beverly some reassurance. Um, I'm sitting here, I, I don't want to brag, I've got four degrees. By the way, I've got four degrees and one O-level. How weird is that? And so, uh, and that's the only O-level I've got. Um, and, and I will read uh, something or I'll sit in front of a professor and I'll have to hear it the first time to get the terminology. And then I'll listen to it or, or read it again and I'll, I'll get some idea of the construct. And about after the fourth time of reading it, it's starting to sink in. I've got the vocabulary, I've got the construct, I'm struggling with the concepts and things are starting to hang together. Do not expect to read some description of this and it goes, I got it, I now fully understand it. It's not gonna happen. You know, this, this is tough stuff. 
I believe, I believe you, I believe you. Uh, well, Peter, thank you so much uh, once again for your time. Uh, what, one of the other takeaways I'll take actually from you is actually your passion uh, for this as well. It's been an absolutely thoroughly uh, enjoyable evening uh, hearing you speak. Um, and yeah, that's been very inspiring in itself, uh, as well as obviously uh, the knowledge you've shared with us. So thank you very much, Peter. Uh, I hope you've enjoyed being part of this show. I, I have really enjoyed it. Yes, it's great fun. And uh, by the way, I have uh, equal passion for everything in my life. Including my wife. How's that? Oh, good man. Good man. Love to hear that. Love to Thank hear you that. so much. So, uh, I'm hoping as well, at some point in the future, we may be able to get you in for a real life uh, discussion as well. So back when we're doing live events, back when we're running live conferences, uh, it'd be lovely to see you in person. I'm sure it would be very well attended. I, um, I've done all kinds of things. So here's one for you to think about. Uh, two years ago, I built a truth engine and I can't get anybody to fund it. But it's an interesting topic to talk about. Perfect. That's, that's booked. Consider it booked. Well, thank you very much, Peter. And thanks everyone at home for joining us this evening. And we'll see you again soon. Thanks very much, everyone. Bye-bye.